Hello, everybody. It is Saturday night at 10 o'clock Eastern time, although I am not in Eastern time. I am in Central time with Chris Carlson. Um, I'm about two and a half hours, three hours south of him right now. Um, I, of course, am Chris Weave, and this is Starfully Tactical. And we are here this time to talk about torpedo boat carriers, um, because for the last, how long have I been doing this show? Three years? Every now and then, whenever we start talking about something that looks like aircraft carriers or something like that, out pops Foudre, the French torpedo boat cruiser. And so I've been teasing you with uh, pictures of this thing for a long time. And I finally decided it was time to sort of d do it for real. I've been threatening for a couple of years now to do it for real. And so uh, I invited Chris to come on because Chris is actually an engineer. I am not. Um, and Chris is, I know a lot about naval history and navies, and Chris dwarfs my knowledge um, on the technical side by about an order of magnitude. Um, and he's got it all in his head um, or in that Im fairly impressive bookshelf behind him. So Chris, Chris provided me with a lot of the stuff that I've got um, in this presentation. And so, um, so that's what we're going to do tonight. But before that, Chris, what have you been up to? It's the middle of April. Guess. You've been sneezing. <laughs> taxes. Oh, taxes. Taxes is, and sneezing. Um, <laughs> I'm allergic to tax. No, that won't work. <laughs> see, I, I got my taxes done like beginning of March. Uh, I would love to get mine done, but I got to do my dad's first. And I foolishly yeah. thought doing a trust uh, tax return would be easier. No, no. It's not. And they don't hold you by the hand. So you have to kind of guess all that you need to get. And then they keep calling you back and forth and whatnot. But um, I'm almost done with mine. Monday, last Monday, I got a corrected 1099. Well, um, let's see. By my watch, it's the 13th. So you've got Monday to, to, to get everything and be in, in under the wire. So. Uh, my extension and payment go in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been there, but not for a while. Not for a while. So, uh, but glad, glad that you're getting that all taken care of. Um, so I am in Des Moines um, because I realized I could kill two birds with one stone. I am hosting the uh, the other thing I do on StreamYard on a regular basis, as opposed to one-off things that I do for people now and then. Um, the other thing I do on a one-off basis is something called um, Connections Online, which is a professional wargaming conference. And it starts on Tuesday and runs through Thursday for the core sessions. And then it's got some extended events. And I had to cancel my last trip to Iowa because I got that nasty cold that still has me coughing a little bit. Um, but it's mostly acid reflux by this point. Yeah. And so I, uh, since I, I, at some point I realized that, you know, I, there's no reason why I'm taking a week off of work to, to do my conference. There's no reason why I have to stay in Dayton to do it. So I, I got myself into Des Moines yesterday and well, no, I actually came into Des Moines. I left, I left Dayton yesterday. I left Dayton yesterday, spent uh, last night at my friend, uh, Ralph Mazza's uh, place. He's an old gaming buddy. And then drove in this morning. So I'm going to be here all week. So this is, I'm going to do next week's show from, from uh, this location as well. Um, not sure what the topic is going to be yet. There's a couple. Realistically, because of the number of slides I've got, we may be talking about torpedo boat carriers next week too. That That's a real possibility. Um, 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 so we'll, we'll, we'll see how far we get with this. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I don't think there's anything else. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the slide deck. If I can find my cursor. Okay. So here we go. So first the obligatory admin slide. Um, you can see next week I'm scheduled to have a show and then there's four in a row where I'm not having a show. And for the first three, I'm on TDY. Um, so I'm going to Washington DC and I'm going to be, uh, locked away. Uh, doing uh, doing something that's literally a um, six day a week event for the first week. Um, they've told us that the building closes at midnight, so we have to be out by eleven p.m. 
there's one day where where the building closes at eight, so we have to be or nine, so we have to be out by, by eight. But most of the time, it's just the building closes at eleven p.m. So it's going to be some really long days, including a Saturday, and then I'm going to just recover from uh, from that, and then I'm going to uh, uh, on Sunday and do some laundry, and then do it again for another week, and then drive back. So that that sucks up the twenty seventh, the fourth, and the eleventh. And then I get back on uh, like on a Saturday or a Sunday and then immediately turn around and go to Marcon at the end of the week. So anybody who wants to go to a science fiction convention in Columbus, you know what I look like, right? You know what I look like. It's not that big a con. Find me in the hallway and I'll tell you we're getting an extra room to sort of hang out in and stuff like that. And I'll be happy to let you into the room. Um we kind of did this a little bit last year, had a, a grand old time. It's actually a little bit different weekend. Uh, it's the weekend before Labor, uh, not Labor Day, uh, Memorial Weekend. And it's a different hotel than we had last time. Um, but we're hoping it's going to be a lot of fun like it was last time. So anybody who's in the area, just stop by. It's sort of, it's not quite, there isn't quite a critical mass to call it an official Starfleet tactical meetup. But last last year, Rob Davidoff did did uh, participate a little bit, and so did uh, TJ Zadlo in the going to the museum phase of it. We're going to go to the museum on fr on Friday morning before the con starts, um, and so that was a lot of fun. And then I'll be back with regular shows again on the 25th of May. Um, I started to say that I was going to start the Exordium read-along soon, and then I realized that if I start the read-along on that, then I'll get totally obsessed with Exordium like I do every time I do this, um, and maybe even obsessed with the game that my friend Arius Kaufman and I uh, uh, put together for it. And I don't want to do that because I owe Chris Carlson a game. <laughs> yeah, I owe Chris and his partner Larry Bond a game. Um, oh, I'm redoing a game that Peter Perla and Mike Markowitz and I did called Sea Powers, um, putting the hood up, trying to turn it from a four player only version into a two player version and do some extra naval history stuff in it. It's just a, it's a little nifty little card game about the pre-World War One naval arms race. And so um, I'm, I'm terribly, terribly late on all this stuff, um, but I'm up to my eyeballs um, because basically uh, I'm a one person wargaming shop at my, at my employer. And um, we used to be like a three person wargaming shop and the demand signal is almost as great now as a one person wargaming shop as it was when we were a three person wargaming shop. So busy, busy, busy. Um, uh, my opinion's not my employer's. Um, I think that Chris is self-employed, so maybe his opinions are his employer's opinions. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that works out. And um, I, you know, there's a few images I've thrown in here. Most of them, most of them, I think, are from French postcards, <laughs> uh, which French postcards turn out to be a surprisingly important part of the story. Um, and uh, but everything's the property of other people. And so I'm here to critique it and use it for educational purposes. I'm not trying to violate anybody's uh, copyright. So here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, first, a little bit of scene setter about what we're going to talk about. Um, the short answer is torpedo boat cruisers. Um, and so we'll talk about what we mean by that in torpedoes and stuff like that. Then we'll talk about some early British efforts. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about Fudra because Fudra is a very interesting ship. And it's the one I keep going back to a lot. And then we'll sort of roll into some science fiction into it. And if it looks like if we get to the point where we're getting to the science fiction and we're already past the hour mark, I'm going to throw the flag at that point and we'll do science fiction next time. Um, and that'll give me a chance to beef up that session, section uh, a little bit um, because there's some other stuff I could put in there. For instance, I could put in some Renegade Legion, which is something that I've talked about in the past. And I can go back to back, back to that again and I can expand some of the examples, et cetera, et cetera. I want to do one on science fiction torpedo boat that sort of concept anyway, like just focused on that at some point. And this would give me a good core to start off with on that. Okay, so many times you've heard me talk about Julian Corbett, Sir Julian Corbett in his book, Some Principles of Maritime Strategy. Uh, Corbett was a lawyer in England in the late 1800s, early 1900s. 
who, through an interesting series of events, found himself as a naval strategist um, and a high level naval strategist, as in like teaching at their at their war college sort of naval strategist and writing book, you know, official government employee writing books on naval strategy. Um, he was a person that people paid attention to. He wasn't just, he wasn't just a guy with a YouTube channel. Um, he was somebody who was actually sort of up to his eyeballs in this stuff. And in his book, Some Principles of Maritime Strategy, this is the, the it's a very interesting, very sophisticated book. I think I, I'm almost positive I did an episode where I co compared and contrast it with Richmond K. Turner's uh, strat pre-World War II strategy document back when, when, it, when he was Captain Turner before he became Admiral Turner. I think I did that episode. I know I was talking about doing it, and I think I remember putting it together, but I couldn't find it. So maybe I still need to do that episode. Um, you know, Gordon Dixon, the famous science fiction author, um, tells us you should at a con. And, you know, like, what about such and such? And he'd say, well, remember when X happened, blah, blah, blah. And he'd go into this explanation about how this event in the in the timeline had affected things and et cetera, et cetera. And then he'd slowly notice all the people just staring at him, like, what are you talking about? And then he'd go, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot. I haven't written that story yet. And so he had it in his head, but he hadn't actually put it on paper. Um, I never really quite appreciated that until I started doing this show. Now I totally and completely get that because there are times where I think I need to talk about such and such. And then I discover I talked about it two episodes beforehand because I've got this sort of running dialogue in my head about all the stuff I need to talk about. And sometimes I forget what I actually have done shows on and stuff. And I, I try to keep track of that. And I'm trying to do a better job of keeping track of that, but not as good as I, I, I could. So um, Corbett generally splits the, the, the I, I said the fleet there, I should say the mission of the Navy into three categories. You've got the battle fleet that's really about capital ships fighting for sea control. I should say if they can, but it's mostly to protect the flotilla as the flotilla goes about its business. If you can go out and schwack the enemy's battle fleet, then you've got total control of the sea. You can just sort of do whatever you want. And if the if the enemy is so uh, so complying with your wishes to put his battle fleet in your jaws so that you can just, you know, snap its neck off, that's fantastic. Usually the enemy is not willing to do that. Now, he was a Brit during the time of the heyday of, of uh, British uh, naval sea power. So it was very much in terms of getting, get it, you know, I'm, we're the top dog. We need to, if we can get the other guy to, to, to come and let, let us kill him, that'd be fantastic. Then he talks about cruisers as being sort of the commerce rating and protection force. So they are responsible for maintaining the sea lines of communications and threatening the other guy's sea lines of communications. So fast ships sort of operating by themselves or in small groups going around doing commerce rating or doing convoy protection type stuff. And then finally, you've got the flotilla, which is the inshore stuff that is doing things like maintaining the mine barrage, uh, minefields, uh, clearing mines, um, uh, doing, doing, you know, sort of patrol stuff, et cetera, et cetera, harassing the other guys' forces that are doing this, et cetera. And every now and then you'd have to send in a cruiser just to make sure that the other guy stayed honest um, or, or you'd send in something a little bit heavier and, you know, maybe it's the possibility that at some point, you, you know, you could use that to convince the other guy to bring his battle fleet out. But in general, what you're talking about is a bunch of small ships, um, frequently like converted, converted fishermen and stuff like that. In World War One, they used a lot of converted fishing trawlers and stuff like that to lay mines and to sweep mines and to do stuff like that. And it's just sort of the work a day cop on the beat sort of stuff that nobody that isn't sexy and nobody really talks about. But in Corbett's mind is really one of the fundamental pillars of what it means to be a sea power. So, Chris, any thoughts on that? Any? It, it's he he spends a lot more time <clears throat> on the cruisers and on the flotilla part of it. Um, Mahan tends to spend more time on the battle fleet part of it. But um, no, that's a that's a good rundown. I find um, I find Corbett to be more readable than Mahan. Yes, uh, 
Mahan has um, a style of English that, first of all, is impenetrable as an audiobook. I tried. <laughs> the sentence structure, et cetera, just does not work as an audiobook. And it's it's really kind of hard to follow. Just I mean, it's old timey English. And um, it's interesting because there, there's two schools of thought about Mahan. Um, there's the school of thought that sort of says that he was writing within a particular context. And so he might have been focused on fleet on fleet action in part. Part of that context was trying to convince Congress to give the Navy money to build that kind of fleet. And so he was trying to make that fleet as sexy as possible. But the argument is, is that his, his the, the belief is, is that his, um, his argument was more sophisticated than it might at first appear. And then there's the other argument that basically says, that he used like he used history in the same way that a drunk uses a light post for support, not illumination, <laughs> that he cherry picked his examples and that he was really sort of a, you know, just sort of banging the drum and not a particularly deep thinker. Yeah. Um, so you got the not a deep thinker on the one side and the other hand was is a much deeper thinker. The context sort of hides it. The, uh, <clears throat> my argument is um, that Corbett and Mahan wrote from two different perspectives. Yeah. Mahan is almost philosophical in nature. He doesn't get into the nitnoids of what yep. is a, you know, what is an offensive strategy? How do you go about doing it? When That's what Corbett does. He gets yeah. into the nitnoids of it. So it's almost like, you know, sea power in its larger sense. And then you, you take the step down and you get sea power as its practical sense. And I really see yeah. it as being practical. Yeah. And that's interesting because, because if you sort of contrast them, the, the argument's been made that, that Corbett is much more like Clausewitz and uh, Mahan is much more like Jean Mene, which actually makes a lot of sense because if you had gone to um, army or Navy, naval officers of the time period of Mahan and said Clausewitz, they'd say, who are you talking about? Because well, Clausewitz uh, wasn't wasn't yeah. particularly well known at the time, but Jomini was very well known. And these days, nobody reads Jomini except as a, well, you should read this guy. He's really <laughs> wrong. But the there again, I think you have that difference of perspective. Clausewitz mm -hmm. is also is almost philosophical. Yeah. And that that's actually kind of the funny thing about it is because Clausewitz is a lot more philosophical, I think, than Jomini is. But oh, Jomini is a lot Jomini is a lot closer to Mahan, who was the philosophical one, than he is to Corbett. So now we should probably not go any further down this because I know I have a degree in strategy. Um, I know that we could easily spend the next 10 hours uh, to crack the surface of the Clausewitz uh, Clausewitz Jomini debate and all the rest. Of it. I mean, and God help us if we ever get into centers of gravity. Um, uh, let's not do that. Yeah, let's not do that. Flee, flee. Um, so, uh, Dustin makes a has a really interesting question here. Let me throw it up real quick. Does Starfleet also set up uh, fleets and Corbett's? Uh, uh, basically, does Starfleet think in the terms of of Corbett's uh, thinking of fleets and flotillas and stuff? <clears throat> the short answer is it does not appear to be that case. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that when I get to the Star Trek site. Star Trek is hard uh, in this case for all the reasons associated with, with uh, many, many TV shows written by Hollywood writers, not naval strategists, over the course of 50 years and with no requirement to actually be consistent. I think Star Trek is really hard to sort of shake into a consistent framework. And that's one of the reasons why, I mean, I've kind of come to the conclusion that the evidence with Starfleet, Star Trek, the evidence is all over the place. And so I try to tell a consistent story and filter out the part that's inconsistent with that story. And I use the filter of Pat Doyle, Sternbach and Okuda, first of all, and then Pat Doyle and Andy Presby and a few others along those lines. Um, and try to try to filter it out to get something that's consistent in the end. And so, you know, the thing is with with Star Trek, 
for any given instance, somebody could say, well, here's an example of X and I can point to two counter examples of that. And then, you know, because they're just not consistent. Now, we also have another problem. Yeah. Corbett deals with a military problem. Star yes. Trek is far more, <clears throat> you know, when you when you get down to the core of it, they keep saying this. They are far more about exploration. Yes. And that I, that's not going to fit in a Corbett Mahan discussion. Yeah, it, it really isn't. Although the Mahan side of things has, you know, Mahan was about maritime power as much as he was about sea power. I mean, he really sort of talks about the importance of commerce, et cetera, which mm -hmm. is actually one of the principal arguments against saying that he, in my mind at least, against saying that he's a particularly sophisticated thinker. And that's because he he acknowledges the importance of maritime trade and all the stuff that goes along with it, yet he ends up focusing on battle fleets, mm -hmm. right? Because his argument is basically, if I wipe the other guy's battle fleet off the seas, I can do whatever I want. Um, or at least that's how the argument always got interpreted by the people who wanted to build big navies. Um, the comment has been made, perhaps a little unfairly, that the best thing that um, that uh, Mahan did in support of the United States was get our enemies all liquored up on his book. And, and you know, the Japanese were big fans of Mahan and the, the Germans at one point were big fans of well, Mahan. The Kaiser was a huge fan. Yeah, the Kaiser was a huge fan. And so the argument is the best thing Mahan did was convince our enemies to listen to Mahan. <laughs> now, that, that's, that's a little unfair. That's a little unfair. Um, maybe only a little, though. And so that, that's actually a conversation we could probably go with. Um, but let's, let's not go there just yet. Um, so let's go back to Corbett. So Corbett has these three things of which you've got the battle fleet cruisers and the flotilla. But if you think about the sort of things the flotilla would do, a lot of that stuff, if you look at the context, he's writing before airplanes are anything other than uh, than like scouting aircraft. And he's writing in the days before radar. And so by the time that, when, you, when I sort of look at it now, it's like a lot of the stuff that he talked about small ships doing are now being done either remotely, right? I don't need to have scouts out. I don't need to have the flotilla sort of out there functioning as my tripwire, you know, preventing, preventing stuff from getting through the line, et cetera. Um, because I've got radar and I've got airplanes, right? I've got maritime patrol aircraft. I got, I got uh, uh, planes can drop mines. Um, uh, planes are part of the solution to sweep mines or at least aircraft in the form of helicopters might be part of that solution. And so when you sort of add all that stuff up, you sort of makes you wonder where, where the flotilla is. And I think that the answer is nowadays the flotilla is largely airborne. Um, but not all of it. And it's not going to be that way in space because we're not going to have airplanes in space. We're going to have spacecraft in space. And so um, it's kind of interesting in that I, I think you can make an argument if you want to run, want to take a real world Navy and run it through the science fiction converter, um, you know, turn it on first. Um, and then file off the serial numbers, you're probably better off in some ways, at least, running an older Navy through the science fiction converter rather than a newer one. Because the older the Navy gets, the more it turns into sort of a one-dimensional problem, surface warfare. And there's not as clear analogs to subsurface and air warfare in space as there are to just surface warfare. And um, when you start add those other domains, you end up with a bunch of weird specialty platforms and a bunch of rock, paper, scissors effects that you, I don't see a reason why you would expect those in space. The one thing that I think might not translate well is the idea of the line of battle because the line of battle was a very, very specific command and control function that these days would be done by radio and computers. And so the, the line of battle solved the problem that we now have other ways to solve in a way that they did not have back then. So, so that's Corbett in the flotilla.
So let's talk about the importance of torpedoes or the automobile torpedo. And we're going to get to why they call it the automobile torpedo later on. Torpedo is a, a term whose meaning has changed over time as technology developed. Um, when it first came out, it was uh, the automobile torpedo was really viewed as being a potentially a totally game-changing weapon because in theory, you could have a speedboat with delu delusions of grandeur launch a one-shot weapon that could kill a battleship. That's a really good theory. That's a really good theory. And the French in particular, with their Junicole, which stood for young school, you know, think think young guns, think upsetting the system. Um, basically, it was especially attractive for them um, because they didn't want to build, the, they didn't want to get into a naval arms race with Britain um, because they were busy worried about Germany and being a land power, right? France is kind of unique in that she was a competitive naval power, you know, usually came in second, but but not always, and was fairly competitive for most of her life, um, most of her history, while at the same time being at, at times a dominant land power. Um, the British army was very good, but the British army was also always very small, whereas the French army was frequently very, very large. And so it was very seductive for the French to go down a path where it's like, okay, we'll use our Navy to do commerce rating stuff. We'll do that cruiser bit. And then we'll use, we can arm the flotilla type vessels with these, these anti-capital ship weapons, and we can neutralize uh, other navies. And by other navies, I mean the Brits. The problem is that torpedoes are not as good as they thought they were, and torpedo boats were not as good as they thought they were. And we'll get into some of the details of that going forward. Now, torpedoes did end up becoming a very important weapon, but first of all, on destroyers as part of a larger battle fleet. So I always say one of the great ironies of naval history is that something called a torpedo boat destroyer turned out to be a better torpedo boat than the torpedo boat itself was. Um, but that, but torpedo boat uh, destroyers were viewed as as operating within the realm of fleet action. So they were escorts for the fleet. And I've talked in the past about how um, in the early 20th century, yeah, uh, an important part of the dreadnought revolution, you know, it's not just about all big gun battleships. It's about the importance of the destroyer as an adjunct to the fleet, as a, a adjunct is the wrong word, as a core component of the fleet. Um, that is equally as important, I would say, as the idea of having all big gun, uh, all big gun battleships. And then torpedoes also get used then on submarines. Um, to great effect, because submarines are, what submarines lacked in performance, they made up in stealth. And then finally, an aircraft, once you got to the point where you had an aircraft who, that could carry a meaningful torpedo. <laughs> Took a while for that. So, all right. Um, so the Brits came up with the idea of like, maybe we should maybe we should carry some of these torpedo boat things around with us. So starting in around 1881, some British capital ships, you know, buy a capital ship, get a couple of free torpedo boats along with it, right? Buy them, collect them, and trade them with your friends sort of deal. And so they would have, I think, I think if I remember it was two for each of these, wasn't it, Chris? Yeah, two second-class torpedo boats for each of these uh, battleships. So, so what's the difference between a first class and a second class torpedo boat? It's all about size. Yeah. Okay. So they're small. They're very small. <laughs> really small. Yeah. And so, like the as we're going to see with Fudra, the ones on the Fudra were fifty-one feet. Um, and like by the time World War II rolled around, the things that when we think of a, a, as a PT boat, right, those are on the order of of either seventy-seven or eighty-one feet. So they're substantially bigger in all dimensions and have a much greater uh, level of armament, um, including having things other than torpedoes. 
So then the British started building some uh, some merchantmen, uh, you know, converting a, they converted a merchantman into um, and I forgot to put the dates down on this, converted a merchantman into a torpedo depot ship. So don't think about something that, you know, goes into combat and and launches torpedo boats in combat. Think about something that po- pulls into a cove someplace and basically functions as a portable torpedo boat base. Right. So now there's a place to there's machine shops and stuff to fix them. And there's a place, to, you know, place to do all the routine maintenance and, you know, stores and a place for the crew to bunk because they're not going to bunk on their torpedo boat and things like that. Then they built the Vulcan, which was purpose built to do this. And carried about twice as many uh, torpedo boats and was about 25 percent faster. And these were all really like mobile self-deploying bases. About this time, you've got the the French start playing in that. We'll get to that in just a second. But um, Chris, do you want to do the slide? Since this is actually one of the slides that Chris threw into this, I can do a quick summary of these. Sure. <clears throat> Having torpedo launches on capital ships is was nothing new. In the 1870s and part of the 1880s. They often carried them, but they were spar torpedoes. Okay, that's this is the Hunley, okay? The, the first submarine, ran around with a spar torpedo. Used quite a bit. Uh, there were several engagements, the American Civil War, the, the Russo-Turkish War. Actually saw them deployed on a steamer, the Constantine. She brought in four, and they made strikes against the Turkish Navy. Uh, and then the French did the same thing when they... Uh, went and beat up on the Chinese in 1884-85. So for the most part, in this earlier part, the spar torpedo, which is, you know, basically ram him with a charge, was used quite effectively numerous times. When the automobile torpedo showed up, that's when people got excited because so in, instead of having to close to 30 or 40 feet, I could shoot away from an order, I could shoot away from two orders of magnitude away. I can shoot from 400 yards. And at the time, that was considered huge. Yeah. Big change. Plus, the automobile torpedo carried a bigger charge in many cases. Yeah. You ran it with spar torpedoes. You ran into a real issue where you couldn't have the charge be very large um, because then it turned into a suicide mission. Uh, Well, it was more likely to be a suicide mission. Um, It was kind of a suicide mission in a lot of ways, anyway. Um, yeah, for because, the Hudley, that was the problem. It had a very large charge, and what killed the crew was the shockwave. Yeah, and so you're you you and and that's an issue. You know, you're trying to, especially if you've got an armor on the or your target, you're trying to poke a hole in the ship. You've got to get very close. So if they know you're coming, they they've got they're shooting guns at you and stuff. And then you got to get close enough, and then a big boom happens. Um, and if the boom is too big, uh, you get to die too. Yes. <laughs> or, you know, like we had with the, the Hunley had a PK of three. It killed two crews before they ever did a successful attack. And I can't remember. Did its target sink? Housatonic was lost. Yes. OK. So so, you know, at at some level, at a very sort of, you know, cal- cold and calculating level, it was probably worth the effort. Um, but it still was still was suboptimal and so being able to take these you started off with so a torpedo started off as an explosive on a stick actually it started off as a mine okay they were called um, yeah yep yep they were moored torpedoes yep and then you get the spar torpedo because it's all referencing an underwater explosive yeah, and so if you go back, the, the phrase damn the torpedoes full speed ahead was not talking about like uh, torpedoes as we would think. It was talking about mines, damn the mines full speed ahead. So, um, and uh, when you talk about land combat, a torpedo is still an explosive on a stick, and you use that explosive to blow a hole in an enemy's minefield. <laughs> so that's one way you can detonate stuff is you stick an explosive out there and then you 
you pop it off and it will take out some number of mines. Um, you know, I will refer to if there are any infantrymen in the in the chat who want to talk about that, I'm more than willing to let them talk about it. It's not my Jeopardy category. Okay, so here's the inflexible. Tell me about the inflexible. Okay, she was um, <clears throat> she was laid down 1876, and she didn't get built finished till 1881, uh, largely because there was hemming and hawing, or did she have enough armor? And in comparison to forgotten things, Italian battleships, but whatever. So this is one of the early turreted ships, and. The two things on the back end there are two 60-foot second-class torpedo boats. And you can actually see one uh, on the right-hand photo on the right, just underneath the ensign. You can see that longer boat, and that's one of the torpedo boats. And it, they had a great big davit. That's um, the uh, crane-like device you see there that it would lift the torpedo boat over and then drop it in the water and come back with the other. Then they would come out and, and uh, work together because torpedoes were very short range at this time. And even though the battleship had submerged torpedo tubes, and I think she also had above water uh, swivel tubes or what they called torpedo catapults, uh, you, you really got to get close. <laughs> yeah. So... Was there any attempt to launch these things in the high seas? I There's not a whole lot out there except to say that it was a difficult evolution. Yeah, in anything but exactly. um, the most pleasant of circumstances, calm seas, good weather. Uh, if it's really bad out, it's really hard because, first of all, these are wooden. The torpedo boats are wooden. Uh, the battleship is not. <laughs> If you try to kiss the battleship, the battleship wins. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I can believe that. And torpedo boats have always had issues with sea keeping and weather and stuff like that, in part because, like, later, by the time you get to PT boats, you're, you're aiming for high speed, and part of high speed is a certain hull shape. That yeah, you, you, want semi, you want a planing hull. You want to basically right on top of the waves. That's all well and good when when it's uh, when it's calm. When it's not calm, you you've basically you've optimized your hull for being bad at sea keeping, <laughs> um, and, and you're already a light ship, so you're going to have sea keeping issues to begin with. Like anybody who's ever taken a speedboat out on, in rough weather knows exactly what we're talking about here, right? You, you get banged all over the place. Um, and then add people shooting at you, and it makes it even more fun. Okay, so this is Endenburg, and these are from uh, Norman Friedman's Victorian era battleship book, just to kind of show you how things are put out. Um, they build two uh, skids to hold the torpedo boats, and then above you see that great big davit that they use to pick it up and then swivel it over. And um, largely because, like I said, Torpedoes at this time are very short ranged. And if you really want to use them, you got to get closer. And these guys had the best chance of getting close. So the Brits actually started with this a whole idea of, of trying to deploy torpedo boats uh, with some capital ships. And, you know, and as we talked about earlier today, Fisher really glommed onto this for battle cruisers. Yeah, Fisher at one point made made some comment about having battle cruisers that would deploy PD boats that would rush into combat and stuff like that. And the thing with Fisher was, you know, Fisher knew what the right answer was, um, and he would make up different reasons as to why that was the right answer, in part because he would just sort of spin ideas off when he's talking to people, right? So he'd spin these ideas off in letters, and then we get them as if they were fully thought through, etc., when in reality it was just Fisher spinning off an idea. Um, and then on top of that, I think there was a, a little bit of, uh, he would try to craft the argument in such a way as to be most receptive to the person he was talking to. Um, and so the end result is Fisher kind of looks like he's all over the map. <laughs> I think there's more consistency there. Um, I mean, he fundamentally thought that speed right. was armor. 
right? He fundamentally his thought focus, that you could His focus is very consistent. Yeah. He's willing to waffle a bit if whatever you like, if speed is the big issue, he'll go for that. If hitting power at long range is the issue, he'll go for that. The bottom line is maximum destructive contact on the enemy. However it takes, that's what he wants. Yes. Yeah. And he wasn't as worried about armor. Um, and so, you know, it's at some point I'm going to, uh, I want to do sort of an extended series talking about different ship types. And uh, I've already decided that cruisers get at least two episodes <laughs> because there's so many different kinds of cruisers and the history of cruisers is so convoluted. Um, uh, or at least, at least it takes a little effort to detangle. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, be between protected cruisers and armored cruisers and why armored cruisers died out. Um, which is fundamentally, they got really, really, really expensive. And then later you could, you could get largely the same capability or better capability for less money when a lot of the dreadnought revolution stuff happened. Um, because as a general rule, armored cruisers were reciprocating steam, vice steam turbines, and steam turbines are just so much better um, in terms of you know the amount of uh, the amount of headache in your engineering space. Which is not to say that steam turbines don't have a lot of headache in your engineering <laughs> space. So um, even if you use a hot rock. Okay, so. So Vulcan and Hecla, which are the two that we talked about. And so, um, you know, Hecla was the first one. Hecla was a merchantman that was converted into service. And uh, Vulcan was actually purpose built for this task. And um, yeah, Vulcan, Hecla, Vulcan is the Brit equivalent of Fudra. Yeah. Vulcan is the Brit equivalent of Fudra and predates Fudra. Mm -hmm. And so they, they they're both more to be thought of as sort of mobile torpedo boat depot. So there, it's a mobile torpedo boat base. It's closer to being a submarine tender than a submarine carrier by analogy, right? You, except it carry, it does carry the torpedo boats, but it's not about launching the torpedo boats in combat. It's much more about pulling into a place where you'd want a torpedo base and sort of have, now you've got a torpedo base there because it's got everything it needs to have for it to be a torpedo base. Okay. Um, let's talk about these there. Uh, I see 67 feet for one and I can't quite make out the other one. I should have. 84 feet, six inches. Oh, so that's that's bigger than I thought it was. That's almost the size of a World War II one. Yeah, but it's still it's still very small. But both of these were done in the late 1870s, and this just kind of, in fact, you can see the one on the right is actually pre-set up to be a spar um, torpedo carrier. Mm. So yeah, you this, see gives the you the idea, this gives you an idea of the size we're talking about. It, you know, you're looking at 10 to 15 tons. They're they're usually wood, um, depending upon the type of, you know, size and whatnot. You're looking at 12 to 18 knots. And you had one or two torpedoes. They were 14 inch. And in some cases, you had a machine gun, either a Maxim or a Nordenfeld. Okay. So not a whole lot of capability there. No. And that's part of the problem. Size. Um and we'll talk about speed, they're not all that much faster than their target in many respects. Yeah, in fact, as we're, we'll get to when we get to, to Fudra's, um, Fudra's torpedo boats, Fudra was actually faster than her torpedo boats were. And this just kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at. <clears throat> this is actually a fairly large second class uh, boat. It's Lightning, it's a model of the Lightning. And that was the 80, uh, 82 footer. And this is what they would have. Um, you would have a machine gun, uh, usually one, two barreled, and then you had a bunch of torpedoes. And the thing I wanted to show you here is we're talking, you know, 20 to 24 knots. Some, you know, the earlier ones are even slower, but by the 18, 
uh, 1880s, we're looking at about 20 knots, and you're looking anywhere between 400 and 800 yards. Yeah. you got to get well, really, really and, close to your target. And this actually get, gets, in some ways, it reminds me of what Jellico said about, you know, Jellico basically said, you know, look, you know, torpedo boats aren't a, aren't necessarily a threat to battleships. They're a threat to mission. They're not really a threat to the ships themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because we can deal with them, but we'd prefer not to because we're busy doing other stuff. And so we'd really like to have destroyers to keep the torpedo boats off our backs and, and other other destroyers. And that, was the that was the whole rationale behind the screening elements. Yeah. And so that's that's why you ended up with escorts. And it was basically... Um, so that the the big gun battleships could do, be big gun battleships, so that they could sort of you know maintain their focus on their primary mission. So it's the same reason why uh, it doesn't make sense to have the senior executive making his own travel arrangements. He can, <laughs> <laughs> he can, but he's got better things to do with his time. Okay, so um, here's Fudra, uh, sort of scene setter picture. She was commissioned in 1897, uh, decommissioned 24 years later, 6,100 tons, uh, 119 meters, 19 knots, pretty respectable for that time period. Um, and she did everything. She did everything except be a target for a nuclear test. Um, she started off as this torpedo boat cruiser tender thing, although they did do like uh, at sea in heavy weather, tried to see what they could do in terms of uh, launching them like in a combat type role. She was a function as a repair ship. She was a mine layer at one point, aviation transport converted into a seaplane carrier, um, converted into just basically being a base for a bunch of armed trawlers during World War One. This was this was apparently the ship that if the French needed to, to do something squirrely, they said, you know, U.S. presidents say, where are the carriers? Apparently the French admirals say, where's, where's Foudre? We've got some squirrely mission to convert her into. So she got to do a lot of stuff in her career, a lot of experimental stuff in her career, which is always kind of cool. So why do we care about Foudre? We care about Fudra largely because of this photo and variations of it, right? Um, this is the photo that I've, uh, variations of this I've been including in presentations for years. And it's because this sort of shows what it does. It's a big ship that can launch a small ship um, that has a weapon on board. And when people do a search for Fudra or when they find out about Fudra, this is usually the first photo they, they seem to see. And um, yes, we're, we're going to go through and show a bunch of cards, a bunch of photos. And as near as I can tell, this and all the other ones all came off of French postcards. Because at one point, they issued like a series of postcards that had pictures of food draw all over it. And you see lots of photos that I think came from that source. And so that's why... Fudra is always the first hit when you start talking about things that carry torpedo boats. She was a big deal in that regard. Okay, so here's the external view of it, and it's a little bit, uh, a little bit cluttered, a little bit complicated. Um, uh, I've got some more stuff here, but this is just basically the external view. So here's a side view. Oh, and I forgot that I went through and tried to get. Yeah, I missed one. I didn't delete the la. Um, Chris pointed out that probably the saying the Fudra all the time is probably the wrong way to do this. And so I thought I had deleted them all. Um, on this particular slide, the green part is the crane mechanism and the red part is, is circling where the torpedo boat is. And so there's sort of um, there's sort of uh, cradles above the deck that hold them in place. And then you've got this overhead system that will slide them sideways uh, until it can launch them. In fact, if I go back to that one, you can see it very, very, very clearly there. Um, you've got something that lifts it up and can then uh, transverse across and drop it into a cradle. This approach is, is a lot better than what the Brits were doing. They were just using a large davit on a king post, you know, typical crane and moving them over. This is almost like a gantry crane. Yeah. And, and so 
So what do we mean by that? What we mean by that is if you go back here, you can see it's got two lifting points, right? So you don't have to worry about the thing twisting. If you've only got one lifting point, like on, on one of those davits in a king post uh, lift, then you know, you've got to have people with lines to pull it, to align it to the cradle. This thing should have no problem aligning it to the cradle all by itself. It should have no problem doing that. Um, I do find it interesting that they've got, if you look, there's guys up on the cranes, mm -hmm. um, which makes me wonder if, is that where the control station was for those cranes? Uh, for the Well, for those particular parts of the crane, you yeah. got two winches on it and you have two winch operators and then you have uh, guys relaying orders from the ends. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this was a this was a fairly complicated evolution. There was lots of moving parts, lots of opportunities for ill-trained sailors to do a lot of damage, and so I'm sure they I'm sure they took this very seriously when they did it. Okay, so here's a top view. Everything uh, the the crane system uh, is outlined in in uh, uh, green. There, um, I. Uh, put red ellipses around the torpedo boats. But as you can see, there's a shit ton of other boats on board this thing. This was just like boat city. Um, and which makes sense. You still need to be able to get ashore and do stuff like that. And if it's sort of setting up its own mobile little torpedo boat base, it's going to have to, you know, move supplies out and whatever. So it's got all these other launches in addition to being the, uh, in addition to having the torpedo boats on board. And I didn't, I didn't circle the ones up forward. So there's an entire another section there. It carries about, you know, right there we see six. So it carries about 12 of these things. That's a pretty hefty, pretty hefty amount of, of stuff to be carrying around um, more so than we see you know, way more than we see some of the other things carrying some of the other ships. Okay, so here's the um, here's the main deck. And as you can see, they sort of built this structure over the main deck. And they've got cradles there to sort of hold the torpedo boats. And then they can lift them with a structure that's, that's out of view in these photos, lift them up and move them over and drop them into the water. Um, you can see a little bit better on the right-hand side, you can see some sort of flattened V-shaped structures. Those are for them. Those are the cradles to put the boats in, in on top of those beams. And so here's a couple of pictures of of the boats being uh you know moved around with the crane being launched as you can see there's one on the one on the left has either just been lifted or is just about to be put in its cradle um and uh it's about to be swung out and then the one on the right's a little bit further along in that process um, I do find it interesting. They've got, you know, people just standing on, on it. And that one guy is clearly walking along as they're moving it. So that um, it must be a pretty smooth ride if that's the case. Um, I think the safety officer is still probably not happy, but that's okay. He'll live. <laughs> what is the safety officer you speak of? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so, you know, single these things these things only had one torpedo and they're the two different versions of it they could either the, one of them had a torpedo that sort of fired backwards and you'd sort of do like a turn and fire at it as you're i guess as you're getting ready to run away the other one had an angled tube on the bow um so it it there wasn't a whole lot of excess uh excess capability there excess capacity and it's unclear to me, I've never seen any photo that shows them loading a torpedo. And so I wonder, you know, my guess is you had to bring the bring the launch back on board in order to reload its tube. And I don't know how they went about reloading it. That'd be interesting to know. Okay, so... These steam launches, steam uh, steam torpedo boats, they're small, relatively speaking, only a few tons um, of, you know, 50 to 80 feet long. Lafoudres were 51 feet long. 
They've only got the one torpedo. It's not a particularly capable weapon um, because it was it wasn't any worse than anybody else's torpedoes. I don't want to make it sound like the French were particularly bad at this. They weren't. Um, it's just torpedoes weren't very capable at the time. Well, in this era, all right, it, it's it's before 1900. Mm -hmm. That means every single last one of these torpedoes are absolutely unguided weapons. They don't yeah. even have gyros. So the ordered course is merely a suggestion to the torpedo. Yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the torpedo boats themselves were slower than Fudra. Um, they only did 16 knots. Fudra could do like 19. Um, not particularly good for sea keeping. They were steam powered. So you've got all the issues associated with that. You have to bring, bring up steam. You know, steam is... Um, Steam is not always known for its ability to quickly respond to changes in what the captain wants. Um, if you've ever taken a tour of a battleship engine room and they tell you about all the stuff that has to happen to get more steam up, it's uh, it, it's a it's a pain. It's a pain. And they're they're basically difficult to recover in anything other but excellent weather conditions. The seas have to be calm. It has to be excellent weather. Otherwise, it's hard to get them back on board. You probably don't want to throw them away. So um, let's see. And so here we've got a little bit of a discussion about these boats. Um, this is just an example photo. The, what you're seeing there is Vedette C. It's the only one made by the British. It's the only one that had a trainable torpedo tube. Um, all the other vedettes, and they all had letters, not names, uh, were made by the uh, French shipyard Schneider. Uh, but all of these were made between 1894 and 1898. So, you know, this is this was cutting at edge technology. I this think. was. Look at what it was made out of. It was an yeah, aluminum yeah. boat. That was freaking new. Yeah, this must have been pretty soon after they invented the new process, right? When mm -hmm. did they invent the new process? So for those not aware of the history of aluminum, aluminum used to be so expensive that fancy people like fancy rich people like Robert E. Lee, rather than having gold or silver cutlery, would have sets of aluminum cutlery. The, 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 the capstone on top of the Washington Monument is made out of a big block of aluminum because it was the most ostentatious thing that we could come up with, right? <laughs> we were such a rich country that we would just, you know, put a big block of aluminum on top of our, our, our pillar. And then they came out with the new process um, that is, I can't think of it off the top of my head, what it's called. That basically means that now we now we make aluminum and we throw it away in soda cans, right? It's it it really 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 made that uh, the smelting of aluminum ore, the separation of aluminum ore, a lot a uh, lot simpler. And aluminum is one of those great recycling success stories. I read somewhere that if you're drinking a soda in December, that 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 particular the aluminum in that can of soda has probably that's it's like third or fourth incarnation that year and something like 90 some percent of the aluminum that was ever produced is still in circulation because it is so easy to recycle it's not like plastic aluminum is so easy to recycle so steel for that matter same as same as true as steel um Okay. Uh, anything else on this? Uh, on this? Nope. Okay. Now there is a problem with making an aluminum hulled vessel, and one of the comments that the that was made in one of the articles was that they had a severe corrosion problem with yes. this. Um, <coughs> so basically, yeah, corrosion because the shaft was steel. Yeah, and so you, you end up. Yeah, you end up with the exact same problem that they ended up with uh, with the LCS two class, the uh, the Independence class, where, um, as I describe it, the Navy decided to build a water soluble ship. Well, not intentionally. The manufacturer said, "Don't do this; it won't work." And the Navy said, oh, "We know ships; we know better." 
<laughs> yeah. So well, she was supposed to have an act of cathodic protection, but <laughs> yeah, and then they got rid of it because it was too expensive. It was cost too much. <laughs> yeah, and so they ended up uh, they ended up going with zinc instead. Um, and the problem is zinc is close enough to aluminum on the, on the uh, periodic table that the ocean was unpersuaded that it was supposed to dissolve the zinc instead of the aluminum and sort of said, you know, I'm just going to go with the aluminum. <laughs> and so you end up with great big holes in the side of the ship. So, so let's uh, I'm not going to open the full <laughs> torpedo boat can of worms because uh, the, that way madness lies. And I don't have enough time for it. And we are going to do this as a two-parter because I'm I'm not we're we're just getting close to the science fiction section. Um, but uh, I'm going to avoid opening that can of worms for a bunch of reasons. First of all, no two nations had the same idea about what a torpedo boat was, uh, especially by the time you got around to World War II, where you know, as a general rule, uh, at least as Americans, we think of PT boats, but that isn't the, the same as the German e-boat. The German e-boats were, if I remember correctly, bigger and they sort of had a Much different bigger. role. Yeah. And I, I don't, I just don't, to be honest, I've never pulled the thread on German e-boats. I don't understand them. Um, German, German e-boats were coastal convoy raiders. That was their main job. Okay. So they, yeah. Okay. That's a little bit different. Um, the roles of PT boats, uh, like in U.S. usage, uh, evolved tremendously over time. Um, by the end of the war, you know, they started off as PT boats with the thought that maybe they go and torpedo something every now and then, hence the torpedo boat part. By the end of the war, I think they even stopped deploying tor the torpedoes because the torpedo was just a big explosive that could get hit by enemy fire. And they were doing all their work with guns. So they were going and shooting up barges and stuff like that. And they weren't really doing anything involving, you know, shooting at anything that was like a real warship that they'd need a torpedo for. Well, and, remember, towards that part of the Pacific War, uh, the Japanese fleet had uh, yeah. suffered a fair amount of attrition. And they had gone to barge traffic um, to carry yeah. supplies. Well, barges are too shallow. You can't use a torpedo against it. Well, and it's a waste of it's a waste of a perfectly good torpedo. So, I mean, it it's really kind of overkill for that sort of thing. You might as well just shoot it with a gun. Um, you might have to shoot a few rounds with a gun, but you can shoot an awful lot of ra gun rounds before you get to the cost of a torpedo. True. Um, now there were two different. Uh, the, the, this is a little pedantic trivia thing. There's two different types of torpedoes that they use during the war. And I saw something earlier today that talked about how they made the decision to go with the with the the second type of torpedo because it was lighter. And it's like, no, they made the decision to it happened to be lighter, but they went with the second type of torpedo because it was better in every way. It was smaller, it was lighter, it was faster, it had a bigger warhead. And you didn't need a torpedo tube for it. Those big torpedo tubes, when you sort of think of McHale's Navy, for you old people like me out there, <laughs> you think of McHale's Navy and you think of the torpedo boat with the big torpedo tubes, those were pressurized tubes that they would shoot the torpedo out of because those torpedoes had to go out that way because you couldn't just roll them off the deck because the gyros would get all fritzed and now your gyro isn't working. Whereas the air launch torpedoes, they just had them, in fact, I can't, I can't tell if they've got them on this or not because it's pretty small nope. on my screen. No Mark 13s. The Mark 13s, you basically just pulled a lanyard and it opened a couple of, uh, you know, the, the brackets holding it in place just sort of fell away and it rolled off the ship. Um, and like I said, faster weapon, longer range, bigger warhead, better in all ways. It was the, the air launched one and it was sort of, it was a much, much later design than those uh, earlier. What were they? Mark 10s? Yeah, the Mark 10s. Yeah. And the, the, so they were just much better all maybe the way around. Mark 15s, maybe. But they're not as cool looking. They're not as cool looking as the. Well, the only as, reason why the Mark 13 really had more punch um, is because they had Torpex explosives. Yeah. And so they actually had a weight wise, a smaller weight 
of explosive, but from a TNT perspective, they had a much larger punch. Yeah, much more, much larger. So the places where torpedo boats really did well were places. There, there's lots of islands in the South Pacific where you could you could make hay with torpedo boats, right? You could you could ambush stuff. You could be waiting in the dark. And you could speed over, you know, you see a bunch of barges and you can speed over and, and schwack them. Um, but like I said, they were more effective. They ended up being more effective as gunboats than they were as torpedo boats, in part because there was more use for, you know, more need for gunboats than there was torpedo boats. And they ended up being much more effective in doing sort of the general flotilla type tasks of, you know, dealing with barge traffic and preventing infiltrations and stuff like that than they ever were at the attacking capital ships role. In fact, I'm not even sure what was the largest ship that was ever attacked by like a PT boat. I think it was a well in the Pacific. Any place. Earth. Oh, we'd have to look at the Italians. They had the best chance. Because they they went crazy with torpedo boats. Um but in the Pacific I think it was a light cruiser was the biggest thing they tagged. Yeah and that, that kind of makes sense. That kind of makes sense. I mean in part because as a general rule, you know, these things had a shallow draft. They were good in the, in the literals and um, you don't, they were good in places where you don't want to take battleships. In fact, uh, one of the things that's really notable about the battle were uh, of uh, Washington versus Kirishima versus South Dakota is that those battleships were there to begin with. U.S. doctrine said, do not send battleships into waters like that. They were very restricted. Battleships like to have room to maneuver, and they didn't have room to maneuver there much at all. But Halsey was just desperate. He didn't have anything else. Now, we and did he, use them at Sir Garo Strait. We did? Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, we used them to harass the Japanese um, as they were coming through, and then we had the old battleships forming a gun line after the PT boats had just, you know, completely screwed everything over <clears throat> and, you know, got out of the way and the big guys started shooting. Yeah, that, that I, I had forgotten about that, that they, they, they did form, if I remember correctly, didn't they, didn't they form like a picket line across? Uh, it was, I think like a wedge. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, I mean, that was an interesting battle all the way around. The, port, the, the torpedo boats actually got to go and sort of muck with some big boys. Um, you know, we fought a battleship on battleship action. You know, it was like the only fleet action we ever fought with battleships. And it was the oldest ships in the fleet that fought, that, fought it um, because they were the ones that weren't escorting the carriers because they weren't fast enough to escort carriers they were there to do shore bombardment but they had a bunch of uh, armor piercing ammo in case they needed it and they did and jesse oldendorf got a got a destroyer named after him as a result so pretty cool okay so was fudra a failure so you can make the argument the torpedo boats weren't very good, you know, cutting edge technology of the time. But in the end, could they actually do the mission? And the answer was really they they weren't particularly impressive specimens of uh, of naval technology, um, of naval capability. I mean, they were they were pretty they were cutting edge at the time, but they that didn't mean they could get the job done. They were hard to launch and hard to harder to recover. And torpedo boats in general just didn't have a role in fleet battles. And so if you're if you're conducting, you know, if you're building something with the idea that you're going to deploy stuff in a fleet battle, um, then then you'd kind of conclude that Fudra was a failure and it didn't work. I would make the slight distinction by saying small torpedo boats that Fudra carried. Um, because later on, you had first-class torpedo boats, which are much larger, which can go with the fleet and did participate. Yeah, um, I'm not sure they ever really made a difference. Jellicoe turned away. <laughs> yeah, but 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 that by that point, you're pretty much talking about destroyers, aren't you? 
A lot of the stuff the Germans had were called torpedo boats. They were approaching destroyer size, but they were specifically called torpedo boats. Okay. That's a that's a good point. That's a good point. So the another part of that counter argument that Fudra was actually a success was that she was experimental. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, well, how do you define a successful experiment? Did I learn something? And the French learned a lot. They they learned about how difficult it was to launch and recover. They learned about um, all the issues with trying to make this thing work. So from that standpoint, um, you could argue that she was a success and that they ran her through her paces and she got uh, the, the French Navy learned, learned a bunch of stuff. Um, it was certainly a success as a way to set up a base. Mm hmm. So maybe you're looking at your objective is to be able to go and um, use them in a fleet action, but, you know, you can still set up a base with them and that that's still potentially very useful. And so, you know, if I can make do with that threshold goal of being able to set up a base, you know, maybe I didn't make, meet the full objective, but it's still useful to do that. And I would also argue that conceptually you can make the argument that torpedo boat cruisers are pretty close to what we currently do with aircraft carriers, right? It's essentially the same idea that you've got uh, a big ship carrying some small high-performance vessels that are armed with ship-killing weapons. And either for the battle fleet role or you can, you know, they can function in the flotilla role. And that's essentially what an aircraft carrier is. It just uses aircraft instead of something like a torpedo boat. And so just as Corbett, you know, I made the argument earlier that most of the flotilla missions that Corbett talked about have been taken over by aircraft. Okay, so aircraft carriers sort of took over the torpedo boat mission because torpedo boats weren't, torpedo boats, boats weren't the capability that they were looking for. They were looking for something to fulfill a particular mission. They thought that maybe torpedo boats could do it. Torpedo boats couldn't really do it, but airplanes can. And then they built something to carry the airplanes. So from that standpoint, you could say you can draw a line from La Foudre carrying those steam launches to the USS Nimitz. You can also say Foudre paralleled a development in an area we don't really want to talk about because it's not very sexy. That's maintenance. As a depot ship, she would have maintenance capability to repair her, you know, her brood. Yeah. And from that, you could make the argument that the tender evolved from. Yeah, and she she got used as a tender role in several points of her career. She in World War One, she was uh, she was servicing trawlers, armed trawlers that were out doing flotilla stuff. Um, in, uh, you know, she was a seaplane tender at one point. Um, the idea of a dedicated support vessel necessary to keep a frontline unit off being a frontline unit, you know, the ability to, to push something like that forward is a very, very big deal. A very, very big deal. Okay, so now we're at the point where we would talk about science fiction equivalents. I'm just going to go through this slide very briefly, and then we're going to declare victory, and we'll come back and talk about this again, and hopefully Chris can come back next week and we can have a science fiction discussion about this stuff. Um, these are the ones that, I'm, that I decided to start off with um, because these are the ones that were just sort of in, in a lot of ways were easiest, but I want to pull the thread a little bit more. And you can see that there's some commonalities between these. So the, the first three there are books, book series. Um, then you've got the Traveler RPG, which I'm sort of treating as a book series for purposes of this discussion. And then you've got Star Trek as sort of the odd man out. Um, Dustin says Babylon 5. Yeah, Babylon 5 could go in here, but Babylon 5, you don't. In Babylon 5, you see ships carrying uh, carrying fighters. You see sort of a, a more, uh, it was more explicitly aircraft carrier-like and not really torpedo boat-like. But I, I'm pretty sure I can come up with another couple of examples here. You'll note that there's a few common elements. All of these sort of deal with the idea that FTL drives are limited to larger ships. 
right? There's and in on in addition to that, there isn't really any um, tactical FTL capability, right? I can't sort of jump around. My battleships can't do tactical FTL jumps and sort of move it faster than light speeds inside the system. They come in from out of the system. They cross some magic threshold or come through some warp point or do something like that. And then at, after that, they're a sublight vessel until they go beyond that barrier again and can leave. And they dump out these torpedo boats that go around and do torpedo boat equivalents or something like it that go out and do stuff like that. Um, in some cases, you have a performance penalty for larger ships. Smaller ships are able to out accelerate them. In fact, that's true of most of these. The big exception to that is CJ Cherry's Alliance Union Universe, where carriers are really wicked fast because they got really, really big engines. Um, and the, the exact mission that these forces do in combat is somewhat mixed. In some cases, like Scott Geyer's Ganellan, they're basically functioning just like the air wing. Uh, David Weber and Honor Harrington specifically says they're not fighters. They are something else. And they, they're really much more like escorts. Traveler is really the only thing that really talks about something that looks kind of flotilla-like. And in C.J. Cherry's universe, they're, they're a lot more sui generis, but they're a lot closer to being escorts. Um, but there's some peculiarities in her universe that make that work. Star Trek is, of course, all over the map, and I'll talk a little bit about them. And in all these cases, there are specific assumptions of the universe that drive the problem. And in the slides that I'm not going to show you this week, I tried to talk about those particular specific assumptions. So, so Chris... Before we declare victory, any uh, any thoughts on this? The, any closing closing ideas that you want to toss out? Well, since I've only read three of the four examples up there. Um, yeah, you haven't read Ganellan, have you? No, I have not. I've read uh, the Alliance series, Honor Harrington, quite a bit since I'm trying to work a game out on that. And... <clears throat> The only thing I would say about with Traveler is when you get into the Battle Rider, I don't think that's Flotilla. I think that's trying, to do, that's trying to do the Battle Fleet on the cheap. Yeah, and so Traveler is interesting in that Traveler has carried craft that go from battleship size down to fighters. And and arguably everything in between. Um, and then they make things more complicated by using the word cruiser in a context that doesn't mean cruiser in a naval sense, but rather means cruiser in a cop on the beat sense. So like when you talk about patrol cruisers, they're really talking about things that are more about counter piracy, et cetera, than anything that you would think of as being a cruiser, like, you know, a heavy cruiser or a light cruiser or something like that. And so they're they're. I won't say that they're inconsistent. I would say that that it's easy to be led astray by their terminology choices. Well, as you said, it depends on the universe that they're working yeah. with them, because these are all radically different, really, when you get down to it. Yeah, they are. They are. Um, they they share a few things in common. Um, uh, if for our purposes, they share the idea of, like, I'm going to use a big thing to carry a small thing someplace. That's going to go and blow something up. <laughs> yeah. But other than that, and... Um, um, you know, there's there's all sorts of, of things, all sorts of approaches that you could do with all this stuff. And I think it's really, um, really pretty interesting, really pretty interesting. So but that's going to be uh, next week. Chris, do you think you're available? I think so. I will be on travel, uh, but I think I can make that work. Um, I'm going back to Virginia to visit some friends who are in the hospital. OK. All right. Well, um, and if you uh, are you going to are you going to be in northern Virginia? Or are you going to be further south on the 18th? I will probably be in northern Virginia. Probably. You are welcome to invite him to join us. <laughs> I will. 
I will see if Herr Bond wishes to make an appearance. <laughs> I'll be well, at his house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And um, and I, I, to be honest, I did not truly appreciate what a big science fiction fan he is until I saw his basement. Oh, he's, you need to go and see the guest room downstairs. And yeah, I just sort of the, stuck my head in. I didn't really spend a all the time. old analog magazines. He's still got them. Yeah, on the shelf. It's just it's it, it's just outstanding how much science fiction stuff he has. Well, plus, he's got a, a really wicked model collection. I mean, he's got oh, the, Ares, right. the Ares lander from two thousand and one. He's got the moon bus. Bunch of Star Trek stuff. Yeah, he's he, he's got lots of uh, Starship Trooper. Bugs galore. <laughs> well, <laughs> hopefully we can uh, we can pry him onto the show. We can convince him to come onto the show. So, um, but with that, I think I think it's time to to declare victory. And uh, no questions. And uh, yeah, I, I'm. I don't see anything that strikes okay. me as something we need to immediately address. Um, if I'm wrong about that, everybody, come next week and ask me. Uh, ask us again then, and we'll we'll take another look at it, um, and we'll do a little bit more specifically science fiction stuff next time. Now that we've got a pretty good solid solid. Um, ah, one more time in English. Solid foundation on this stuff. So with that in mind, everybody, thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs>